All right, well, good evening. Believe it or not, uh, we are coming to the end of our study on the Holy Spirit. And this is going to be the last, uh, the last study we're going to be looking at, the fact that the Spirit of God uh, unifies the body of Christ. Now, I thought uh, since this is the last one, I would just kind of quickly do a, a review of the different points that we've seen up to this point, although not exhaustively. So let me just ask you with regard to the Spirit of God. Is the Spirit a person? Yes. Is He a divine person? Is He the same person as the Father and the Son? What, what, somebody said yes. Okay. Not the same person. Okay, they're all, they're, they're distinct persons. And what is the particular characteristic that the Spirit of God is known for? Love, that's right. He is the love of God. Now, with regard to his work, uh, what is it that he gives to his people in the work of regeneration? Okay, faith, and what causes that faith? There, what's that? Regeneration. Okay, regeneration does. Regeneration actually produces something in the heart that makes one trust in the Lord. What do you suppose that would be? Love. Yes, that's right, love. Love appears to be the cause of why it is we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, if we hate him, we're not going to trust him. But if we love him, we receive him. So I believe that the Spirit's work in uh, redemption is to create that love, which is what he does in regeneration. Now, in sanctification, what do you suppose he does? As he continues that work, what, what would you think he would be doing to make us more like Jesus? Uh oh, if it's taking that long, you're going to get <laughs> kind of not following this line of thought. He, he increases that love, okay, makes that love grow. Okay, we also saw that in calling, as far as um, helping us to know what his will is for us in life, he basically gives us a desire to do something. Uh, with our lives. He gives us a love for something, you know, what he wants us to do. Um, with regard to increasing our zeal and giving us strength in the Lord's work, he basically, again, that's, that's another aspect of sanctification. Uh, he basically increases our love for him so that we're more zealous in the things he has called us to do. Um, what do you suppose the Spirit of God does to help us study the Word of God? What's that? That's right, and that's uh, the work of illumination is basically to make, well, to, to help us see the divine beauty of the Word of God and cause us to desire it so that we study. What's that? Yes, well, yes, now the way that he helps us understand it is likely that he helps us focus more on it and makes our heart open to it, uh, whether or not, well, I suppose there, there is a sense in which he may help us you know, bring other scriptures to mind and so forth and lead us in the scriptures. But we, we do want to understand that he doesn't necessarily, I mean, he doesn't, certainly doesn't communicate new truth to us, okay? But uh, this was a point that Edwards made, that the way that he, he helps us most of all in our study is by disposing our hearts to this word and, and causing us to focus on it with a kind of focus and intensity that we wouldn't on other books because this is God's word. Okay, and then, of course, he helps us obey and he restrains our sin by giving us a love for the commandments of God or a love for righteousness. And then he increases our joy and our peace and our assurance by affirming God's love for us and by, um, uh, well, giving us, we might say, a delight in God, causing us to love him and giving us a sense of God's love for us. Uh, and if we have those things, it, it does give us a joy in knowing God, gives us a peace in knowing that we are loved by God, gives us an assurance that we're on our way to heaven. So all of these things can be, in one way or another, resolved into the Spirit's particular nature, which is love. Now, not surprisingly, we're going to find the same thing is true with regard to how he unifies the body of Christ. So what I would like to do is um, have, well, I hope, I hope you brought your Bibles, because I'm going to be asking you questions from, this, uh, from the text we're going to be looking at this evening, and perhaps somebody could even read the text. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Um, somebody care to uh, volunteer to read that? Okay, Kathy? And could you read loudly so that everybody could hear? Okay, now keep, keep your Bibles open to that text, Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6, because I would like to um, ask you some questions uh, from that text. First of all, what, uh, and some of these are going to be obvious, but please uh, uh, answer them anyway, okay? What, what is Paul referring to here by, by body, the fact that there is one body? Okay, he's referring to... One church, and now what one church is he referring to? Is he, is he referring to the Ephesian church, the Colossian church, the church at Philippi? Is he referring to the OPC? <laughs> what, what church is he referring to here? Okay. Church of Christ? Believers? Okay, all of God's people. Now, we might call that church um, the universal church, uh, if we were to, that's actually what it's referred to, I believe, is it in the Apostles' Creed, the Universal Church, um, which tells us that God's people are spread, not, I mean, they're not just in one denomination, but they're spread out in a variety of denominations. Uh, if we were to put the label visible or invisible church to this, which, would, which label would we use? What's that? Visible? Okay. In, the invisible, even though there is some overlap, when we're talking about the body of Christ, okay, very, most often it's referring to those who are truly His, because is it possible to have a visible church, a local fellowship with unbelievers in it? Yeah. Well, yes, it is, it is possible to do that. Okay. So the invisible church are those who truly have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how many, how many bodies, in this sense, does the Lord have? One body. There's only one church. Now, note the repetition of the word one in our passage. He says, uh, first of all, he, he, well, he tells us how many spirits are there. Okay, there's just one Holy Spirit. How many lords? Well, there's only one Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, how many faiths? He says there's one faith. What do you think he's referring to here by one faith? Faith in one what? Okay. Well, that, that is true. That's one of the senses in which it's used. Um, could be referring to that faith by which we trust in the true Lord. What, what other sense is the word? And I'm not sure which one it is myself. But what, what is the other sense in which faith is used? Right. The faith once delivered to the saints, which is the gospel. Okay, so uh, faith is something we believe. Faith is also um, the act of believing. And we're not sure exactly what he means, but whatever the case, there's only one of each of those. One true saving faith, there's only one gospel. Uh, how many baptisms are there? One baptism, and what do you think he's referring to here by baptism? Spirit baptism? What else could it mean? Water baptism, which represents spirit baptism. I would tend to think from the context, it's probably referring to spirit baptism, which you mentioned. But I, I noticed the commentators were a little bit um, um, divided there. How many gods and fathers are there? Okay, there's just one. How many hopes are there to which you've been called? Now, realize that every member of the body of Christ has all of these things in common, don't they? 
They've all been baptized into one body by one spirit. They've been called by one God, called to one hope. They believe in one faith. They have one, uh, well, one grace of faith that we all share in common. Now, Paul is driving uh, at this one point through all this repetition the fact that uh, there is one body, and because there is one body, what should there be within the church, within the body? should be unity. And what is he imploring us to do in this text, or at least the Ephesian church, what is he, what is he exhorting them to do with regard to this unity? What's, to keep it, okay, to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And how much effort are we to put into doing this? Okay, and how does he express it here? Be, be diligent, yes. Um, diligence has perhaps um, maybe the, the connotation besides putting all of our effort into it of doing it on a regular basis, you know, keep it up. Sometimes we might make an effort and then we drop off and then we might make an effort and drop off. Now, as we look at the church around us, can you say that, that the body of Christ has been diligent to preserve this unity of the spirit in the bond of peace? Absolutely not. Uh, the fact that we have all these different denominations uh, and that we call ourselves uh, oftentimes by our distinctives, don't we? You know, Presbyterian or, or Baptist or some even call themselves the Church of Christ, you know, or the Glorious Church of Christ or something like that as though they're the only Church of Christ. Now we recognize that all of these things, all these different churches, if they're preaching the true gospel, are true churches. But sometimes if we wear our distinctives as a, as a label, we, we tend to uh, exacerbate the division that exists among us rather than help. Okay, well we need to ask, um, we need to ask this question. Uh, well, let me see how to put it this way. Um, does it, are, are all true believers in every denomination a part of the body of Christ? Yes. And does Jesus love only the Presbyterians? Does he love only the, the Baptists uh, who believe in him? No. But sometimes we, we kind of, I mean, some denominations think that way, don't they? You have to believe like me, otherwise the Lord isn't going to love you. But the fact is that the Lord loves his whole body. You know, he's the head, we are the members, and he's not talking about just local congregations. Sometimes I think we read it that way, don't we? Uh, it's not just a local congregation that the Lord is referring to here, but he is talking about his whole body, the universal church, the invisible church, all the people that truly believe in him, and they are all his body, and he loves all of them. Let me just uh, read one passage to that effect. John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And this is talking about all of those who have trusted him. I mean, how many, how many of these believers did the Lord Jesus lay down his life for? How many is he interceding for? How many is he going to bring into glory? How many are you going to share eternity with? Okay, it's, it's all of them. Now, if the Lord loves the members of his body, how should you feel towards them? <laughs> you should love them as well. That's right. Let's look up a couple of passages of Scripture just to be reminded of this. I'll take a couple of volunteers. John 13, verses 34 and 35. Okay, Donna. And then John 15, verses 12 through 17. Okay, Sarah. So John 13, verses 34 through 35. Okay, now, as we read this text, what do you, what do you suppose denominationalism has done to this uh, witness that Jesus said would be ours if we did what he tells us to do, which is to love one another. 
what has denominationalism done to this? Have you ever heard the excuse um, that some people use, uh, unbelievers, of course, they're always going to find an excuse not to believe, but uh, there are so many different opinions about what the Bible teaches. Who can really know? Uh, there's so many different denominations, you know, and you all say you believe the same Bible. How can it be true? I'm afraid uh, the way that we have dealt with our differences has um, created a, a bad witness for the church. Okay. Right. Actually, we'll talk about that toward the end, okay, because that, that is something we do want to consider. Because truth is important, um, and obviously we've divided over that, what, what the truth is, but the question is, should we do that? that that's a tough question, but um, yeah, there are a variety of answers to it, but okay, we'll look at that in a minute. And then John 15, verses 12 through 17, and again, think about the answer to that question in light of these passages that we're... Uh, exhorted by our Lord Jesus Christ to love one another. Yes. Okay. So again, we have um, both both of these passages reminding us of the same thing that our Lord Jesus commands us to love one another. And again, this doesn't just apply, oftentimes we just apply it to our local fellowship. But our Lord is telling us that we need to love everyone who is a member of his body. Now, th this is again a redundant uh, question perhaps, but what does the Spirit give to us to help us do this? He gives us love, right? Uh, this is his particular characteristic, and what do you think he wants us to do with this love with regard to all the members of the body? Okay, he wants us to, to love them. Now, get, getting back to the text in Ephesians 4, what are, um, what are some of the fruits mentioned in our text that this love produces that will actually help us preserve that unity? What are, there's basically four things that are mentioned here. Okay. Now, let's think for a second, uh, how, how will these things help? Because, you know, these are the things that, um, these are the things that we need to obviously practice, uh, things, characteristics that need to be true of us. Uh, that we should be exhibiting toward other believers. And the reason why I'm, I'm laboring this is because having been, um, well, I've been in the church longer than 20 years, but been up here for nearly 20 years, I've seen a lot of division, a lot of dividing, a lot of bitterness, a lot of hatred, long-standing hatred, irreconcilable spirits. You know, I've seen a lot of things like this, and that, that's the opposite. I mean, not just here and not just in the past, but uh, I've seen it in, in other churches as well, should, should those things be. Now, the Lord does not give us the, the option okay, to be bitter or to hate or to divide. Is that ever right, to divide from a brother to the point where you won't speak to him or her or all you can do is, is speak evil of them? Is that right? Is that ever right? Okay, there, there is discipline where 
a person is put out of the fellowship of the church, but do you hate the person when you put them out? And, and do you, are you embittered against them and you speak evil of them everywhere? No, you wouldn't do that. But uh, sometimes they do have to be put out of the fellowship, not out of the service, of course. Could, could you turn us down just a little bit? There's a kind of a ringing up here. Uh, by the way, I should mention, too, that I, I did get another report that um, people were having a hard time hearing the broadcast on the other end. I don't know if there's anything can be done to adjust for that, but um, anyway, okay. All right, but there's never an excuse for that kind of behavior with, within the Church of Christ. And these particular characteristics, which are simply the fruits of the love that the Spirit of God produces, should help minimize actually should help eliminate these things and the different fruits again have been mentioned humility and gentleness patience and tolerance so how can humility help <laughs> yeah well as we think about it think think about the opposite of humility pride. pride which is often what causes these kinds of divisions right so how can pride create division in the body of christ Many ways, right? Uh, Donna? Oh, I'm sorry, what did you say, Leah? Yeah, certainly can. Uh, an attitude of arrogance can um, turn people away. Yes, Donna? Okay, we won't treat other people the way we should. We won't submit to the standards. Um, what about with regard to ourselves? If we offend other people, will we be willing to admit that? No, we won't. Um, actually, we won't admit our faults. We won't admit our sins. We won't admit our weaknesses. Uh, what about service? Uh, will we serve other people if we're prideful? To be seen, that's right, again, and that'll rub people the wrong way because uh, nobody likes, you know, show-offs and so forth. But you can see how this kind of thing would destroy unity, but you can see how it's opposite. As our Lord tells us that we should humble ourselves and become servants to one another, uh, humble ourselves and admit our faults and admit our weaknesses and admit our sins and confess our sins and ask forgiveness. I mean, can you... Can you ask someone else for forgiveness if you don't first humble yourself? I mean, I suppose you can, but you can't do it sincerely, can you? And yet that's what's needed in order to be reconciled. And if there's no reconciliation, then there's really no unity. So humility, as you can see, is essential. Now, what about gentleness? Well, what's the opposite of gentleness? Harshness, right? Harshness. And what is, you know, think, thinking about harshness, I mean, what, what is that? Kind of pushy or not, um, you're, I mean, well, does that help unity? You know, if you scaze somebody, if, if they um, do something that's an error, if they maybe hold to something that, you know, that uh, you don't think perhaps is biblical, if you just kind of come down on them and attack them, you know, that's not going to help, is it? I have a, a wonderful example. Actually, I couldn't use the, shouldn't use the word wonderful because that's, that's not really uh, the best way. A terrible example? Well, it's a good example, but... <laughs> okay, a good example of this, um, I, I may have used it before. Somebody visited the church a long time ago. I happened to believe in the charismatic gifts, speaking in tongues and so forth. Somebody in the congregation... Uh, suddenly found out about it while I was speaking to the gentleman uh, up here and just came stomping down, you know, from the back to the front, just basically denouncing that person's beliefs, if you can believe that. Hey, I hear you believe in the charismatic gifts. That's ridiculous. And just really came down on that person. They got into a heated argument. The person left and never came back. Now, I would say harshness, pushiness, uh, didn't exactly unify the body, did it? but drove that person away. But you can see how gentleness, uh, again, we, we, none of us do this perfectly, but the thought occurred to me when, when the person told me that that was the case with them, I, I, I started trying to think, well, how can, I, how can I broach this issue? How can I try to help this person uh, see 
you know, where we're at and why we believe what we believe without, you know, getting into an argument and pushing this person away. Uh, gentleness is what the Lord wants us to do as far as approaching uh, other members of the body of Christ who may differ with us um, in anything, whether if they're in some kind of sin or whether they have some kind of belief which doesn't line up with Scripture. Uh, we need to deal with it gently, don't we? That's the only way we're going to uh, be able to uh, hold on to the relationship that God gives us by His Holy Spirit. Uh, patience, they have to change now. You know, they've got to, they've got to see my way now or, or it's not going to work now. I mean, the opposite of patience is impatience. If, if we're impatient with other people, um, it kind of goes along with harshness, doesn't it? And actually, does anybody know the difference between Patience and intolerance, or impatience and intolerance. I mean, how, what's the relationship between those two things? I know I had to look it up myself because I um, wasn't quite sure what the difference was because both of them have some reference to being patient, right? But let me just say this because this could be difficult to nail down. Uh, the first word actually has to do with, with your own personal state of mind. You know, that you're not agitated, that you're calm, okay? That's, um, that's necessary to preserve this unity of the Holy Spirit, okay? That you be calm and you be patient. Now, the tolerance part of it has to do with the way that you actually express that towards other people, that you are patient with, with them. It's the way we relate to them. And, of course, to... to um, not to be patient or to be impatient uh, can mean that you're getting agitated over the fact that either they're in sin or they're in some error and it sort of puts you out of sorts so you can't really show the tolerance that you need. You really can't express that patience to them. Um, but you can see how being impatient and being intolerant can divide people and uh, how being patient and tolerant uh, can unify them. Who's the perfect example of how to do these things? <laughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And uh, did his disciples ever make mistakes either in life or in doctrine? Okay. And how did Jesus respond to them? Well, oh, I've been teaching you guys for three years and you still don't get it, you know? No, it wasn't, uh, that isn't the way it was. Or he didn't get angry at them in, in any case. I think even when he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You know, that, that he said it in such a way that uh, he didn't, you know, blast Peter or express something that was unloving towards him. I think it must have struck Peter to the heart when he said that. So anyway, our Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect example of putting up with weakness and ignorance and even sin and loving his own, loving them to the end. And even when Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him three times, he says... Peter, not. Peter, you know, you're going to blow it, and, and you're going to do something that's really sinful. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to forgive you. No, but what he said was, I prayed for you, and when you turn again, strengthen the brethren. So our Lord loved his own to the end. I mean, that kind of love, of course, he can love in a perfect way, and again, he's our example, but that kind of love keeps things together, doesn't it? It keeps people together. It doesn't uh, destroy them. Um, now, Jesus did have some pretty harsh words for his opponents, and perhaps our Lord knew that those particular opponents perhaps either were not going to repent, and perhaps they were you know, reprobate, or perhaps he was chastening them with, as some, some put it, a rod of love. <laughs> uh, but um, it, it's never meant to drive people away. It's always something that is meant to draw them near. All right. So again, the Spirit of God gives us love. The love produces these particular fruits. And these particular fruits will help unify uh, the body rather than divide it. Now, let's, let's think a little bit more specifically. Um, getting back to, um, well, getting back to the point that I was making earlier with regard to sometimes how Christians, professing Christians, can divide uh, permanently so, and be irreconcilable. 
But if someone professes to be a Christian and in the name of truth exhibits uh, these negative characteristics, or at least the negative of the things we've seen, okay, pride, uh, harshness, impatience, intolerance, bitterness, anger, hatred. Do, do you ever see that happen? I mean, you've seen it as well as me, right? Okay. Do these people usually think that they are on God's side or, or fighting God? Okay, but according to what Paul tells us here, can they be? No, they, they really can't because the Spirit of God doesn't produce these kinds of fruits in his people, these are the kinds of things we're supposed to be putting to death. But sometimes we, we justify, you know, this, this kind of anger and, and hatred and, and harshness and, and so forth in, in the name of the Lord. Yes, sir? If you would determine whether you're in the wrong as far as, I mean, how you, how you approach somebody or how you deal with them? Or, or are you talking about whether you're right and they're wrong or they're right and you're wrong kind of thing? Well, right now we're talking about attitudes, okay? So th in this case, there's no, no uh, right, we're not talking about what's right or wrong with regard to whether they sinned or didn't sin or whether they're in error or not in error, but how you approach them, okay? It's always wrong to approach them in this way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, well, well actually, um, uh, but getting to your question, I mean, how do we tell who's an error? Um, uh, it, it would be nice to say that everybody is always going to agree. Let's say there's been an offense given. You know, somebody's angry at you or maybe you're angry at something that they did. Have you ever found when you go to try to deal with a situation like that, that you guys, both parties can't agree on the facts? I mean, if you could agree on the facts, if you could see it my way, then you would see that it's your fault, you know, and it's not, it's not my fault kind of thing. That's where we have to be careful about humility, right? We have to make sure that, that we represent what actually happened accurately. Uh, of course, the other side has to be careful to do that too, but I've, I've found so many times, whether it's, you know, it's, whether it's something that, that I'm involved in or whether I'm looking at two different people giving their sides of the story, they always seem to perceive it differently, don't they? And they seem to be honestly convinced that, that that is the way it is. That's the way it happened and so forth. Um, even if you have a bunch of witnesses on the other side who saw it the way that you saw it, the other side still may not see it that way. In a case like that, uh, if you can't agree on the facts, then you're not going to be able actually to determine who was right or who was wrong. So uh, what do you do in a case like that? Pray, you could, um, you certainly need to pray, that's right. What, what else could you do that might bring peace to that situation? Okay, well, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite. Oh, I see. So you're talking about two people who have a difference of opinion on what the Bible says. Okay, I was thinking more about, you know, somebody sinned against the other person, you know, kind of thing. And uh, what if you can't, and, and actually this, well, the thing about truth, if you guys disagree, actually I, I've seen situations where one person has one opinion, and let's say I had a different opinion, and we both came to the text and we both studied it together, and challenge each other back and forth. And there have been instances where, well, maybe, maybe they'll win you their side. Maybe you'll win them to your side. Or maybe you both come away with a new understanding that you both agree on, which, which is interesting. That, that can happen too. But if, if there's a sin that's been committed um, and somebody's angry at you or you're angry at somebody and um, you, you, you simply can't agree on the facts and so say, well, okay, th this is where everybody is to blame. This is what needs to take place. What, what can you do to try to reconcile that?
Okay. If it was a matter of uh, misunderstanding over something said, you could try to, you know, deal with it in that way. You can. See if, if, it's, if it's of a nature that you're willing to do that, you can certainly do that. But one thing would also help is if um, you confess everything that you know that you've done that's wrong and ask the other person for forgiveness instead of expecting them to do that first. Uh, that goes a long ways to uh, bringing reconciliation because sometimes you keep trying to get the other person to confess their sin. You know, uh, they just become offended by the fact that you're trying to do that and they think you should be dealing with your sin. So just deal with yours first. Of course, the problem comes when you think you're not guilty of anything, so you don't confess anything. Uh, you have to be careful. It usually takes two to, to tango, yeah. Okay, but, but again, the point here is we are never justified in dealing, you know, in, in pride. You know, it's all your fault. It's not mine. Uh, in harshness, you, where you're just continually pushing them, as it were, um, and uh, antagonizing them. And the Lord tells us we need to try to restore a, even a brother who falls in, in a spirit of gentleness, right? Because harshness isn't going to do it. We need to be patient because this may take time. We need to express that patience and so forth. But again, um, we, we should never have this kind of attitude. Uh, because what does the Lord, how does the Lord look at division in the church? What does the Lord think of division? Grieves him? Sinful? That's right. Actually, you know, the Bible says that he hates it. Right? I think I read this passage not too long ago in an evening sermon uh, where Solomon writes in Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, well, there, goes, there goes our pride. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Even if it's between you and someone else, the Lord hates division. What does the Lord think about his, his church when he looks at his church, when he looks at all of his you know, all of his children scattered throughout the world and they're all, you know, different denominations. Is he pleased by that? Not really. Now, one thing that we have to take into account, and I think that is that um, a true believer, if they run into another true believer, regardless of the denomination they're a part of, I think they will love each other. Do you agree with me on that? Yeah. Okay. So not everybody's, you know, involved in... I'm right and you're wrong and, <laughs> you know, taking this kind of stand. I'm not going to fellowship with you because you don't agree with me on this or something like that. Okay. Now, even though the Lord would not have us to have this kind of an attitude, it doesn't mean that we should simply overlook, you know, somebody's sin. We do need to deal with it. We've already seen that. And it doesn't mean that we just simply, you know, neglect the fact or just overlook the fact that we have these differences of opinion and, you know, the Bible does, how many things does the Bible teach on all these different things? I mean, can it, can it say one thing and another at the same time? It's, it's one, it says one thing, right? Now, we don't always agree on that one thing is, but how do we deal with those differences? I mean, the way that the church has dealt with it up to this point is they've divided. Now, sometimes you do have to, there are instances where you do such as, and again, uh, it's not that this denomination is perfect by any means, but back in 1936, this denomination divided from a larger denomination because that denomination had stopped preaching the gospel. I mean, they believed that the virgin birth was up for grabs, the Trinity was up for grabs, the two natures of Christ were, were, were up for grabs. Uh, you can accept it or not accept it. That wasn't acceptable, okay? That, that's, you're, just, you're destroying the gospel, okay? And when the church also said that um, we're not going to let you raise money to send Christians on the missionary field, you have to support our denominational missions board, which is sending uh, atheists onto the field. 
you've got to support that. Well, no, we can't support that. We need to send Christians out on the field so they can preach the gospel so that people can be saved. But when you have a situation like that, you can justify division. But oddly enough, that, that group that came out divided, maybe not so oddly, over eschatology and over Christian liberty. Now, I think that's an area where perhaps uh, they, they should have been more tolerant of one another. But how do you deal, you see, with people who have differing views? How would you deal with them? Oh, well, let's say with things that don't strike at the heart of the gospel. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, like, let's say you have um, two Christians who disagree. You know, they, they both hold the fundamentals. They're both trusting in Christ. They both have a love for one another, and yet they differ. Um, on hmm. Right. You, you don't say, well, you do it this way, and I do it that way. Therefore, we're not brothers, you know. Uh, but again, well, I, I think perhaps spending some time together and looking at the issue and trying, you know, like I said before, you know, sometimes you're on one side and the other person's on the other side and maybe by talking together you, go, you come to their side, they come to your side, or maybe you both come to a new position. But you should, should you try to work toward unity? <laughs> because, because what you're teaching, I don't want to. I, I, you know, and so, you know, push down the show. I know, it, it, I'm not saying it doesn't create difficulties in working together. Certainly it can. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why uh, churches, you know, members of the body of Christ have divided into different denominations. We'll still love you. We'll love you over here. While you're over there, and we're both going to keep serving the Lord, but um, we're not going to be able to work together because this issue is too too severe. Uh, that that can happen. Sadly, it, it goes beyond that too, and you know it. it um, you, know, you know, I did I did run into well, it was one of my um, teachers in uh, at college, who um, uh, his his own persuasion was the college's persuasion. So he was uh, dispensational and uh, Arminian, and um, had, uh, let's see, it wasn't, uh, wasn't, well, didn't have, um, oh, anyway, there are lots of differences, but anyway, the, the point was that, that he served in a church that existed somewhere in Mission Valley, where uh, there were those who reformed and non-reformed, Calvinist and non-Calvinist, so Arminian, and, and there were those that were all-mill, post-mill, dispensational, I mean, they had a mix that, that we wouldn't normally think would work well together, and they actually were working together. I'm not sure how that worked. Maybe when uh, one of them preached uh, on a particular topic the others didn't agree with, they just say, well, <laughs> we'll just agree to disagree on that one. Or then they get up next week and, and the next person preaches against that position. <laughs> uh, that doesn't seem like it worked terribly well. But somehow they were able to, uh, maybe, they, maybe they just kind of tried to uh, lighten up on those particular areas and not push too hard. But um, somehow they were able to work together. It'd be interesting to see how well they're still working together today. But, uh, but still, they were trying to love one another. They were trying to work together. Uh, they were trying to express the unity which our Lord tells us that uh, we need to be showing toward one another, loving the members of the body of Christ to show that Christ, well, that we are his disciples, that he does exist, and that we are his. So anyway, the, the point, this closing point on the, on the ministry of the Holy Spirit is simply this. The Spirit of God produces love in the members of the body of Christ. Jesus Christ loves all of his members, and he gives all of his members love for him and love for the other members. And that we are to be jealous. We are to be diligent in, in protecting the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We are not to be the cause of the division as much as it lies in us. We are to love even those we disagree with as long as we can consider them to be brethren. You know, 
because they're trusting in Jesus Christ, not because they see eye to eye with us. Now, again, in order for them to be Christians, they do have to hold to the fundamentals. They do have to believe in the Trinity. They have to believe in the deity of Christ as two natures. They have to believe that they're sinners. All men are sinners. They need to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to believe in the virgin birth, the Bible being the word of God. Um, all men are sinners. And Adam, I mean, there's, there's several things they have to believe. But if they believe those things and they're brethren, we just need to make sure that we love them as brethren because if we're not, um, we're, we're sinning. And if there's anyone in the body of Christ that we know is a believer and we hate them or we're embittered against them, we're in sin. We need to repent regardless of what they have done to us. Now, we may not be reconciled until they actually ask forgiveness, but we still have to desire that they would do that and, and love them and pray for them uh, that the Lord might bring them to repentance. Again, that's after we've confessed everything that we've done to contribute to the situation as well. All right, so let's, um, let's try, by God's grace, to preserve that love and, and even to engender that love as much as possible. Any closing uh, comments or questions? Yeah, well, yes, that is um, sometimes common enemies, you know, like abortion and things like that. Uh, sometimes that draws together Christians, even with non-Christians, to fight against it. But yes, where we do have a common issue, um, the churches do close ranks and, you know, come together against those kinds of things. And, and that's, that's an appropriate thing to do, yes. True. Yes, that. Yes, we don't. We don't um, identify with non-Christian groups as brethren. Yeah, that's true. I'm thinking of what what would be like co uh, what do you call it co belligerency, where we both have a common enemy. We might both come against them and maybe stand united against that, but we would never uh, identify. We'd never want to be perceived as identifying these people as as Christians. Otherwise, we'd just be confirming them in their well, in their sin. Yeah. So we have to work on exactly how to do that. We haven't been faced with that particular situation, at least as a church, but perhaps we have as individuals. Sometimes um, I think even certain movements have caused some groups to come together and have actually put them all into the rubric of Christian. What was it called? Uh, Prom Promise Keepers, I think. I've heard has uh, united uh, uh, Christians with Mormons and, and Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth and say we're all you know, one, one group and give everybody the impression that everybody's a Christian there. But um, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians. They deny the Trinity. They deny the only way of salvation. They, they strike at the fundamentals. So, um, yeah, we can't uh, close ranks in that way. true. You know, it's, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but people will often pray to, to God or a God or something like that, but they, they won't name the name of Jesus because they know that's going to be offensive. That's going to kind of identify 
the God you're praying to that's going to identify you as a Christian whereas the others aren't. I think if we're going to be involved in something like that, we have to name the name of Christ. And that's really the only name we're authorized to ask in anyway. Any other closing comments or questions? All right, then let's uh, have a um, word of prayer to uh, close this time, and then we'll gather in the back.